Amen? Amen. Let's welcome Alex for the main message. <laughs> well, if you guys' hearts were open, you guys can go home and already go home happy if you were listening to what Dan was talking about. He gave over basically all the key points that I think that I would want to go over and just kind of jump into. But I know that if I don't say anything, Dan's already said enough. I just want to bring to your attention that I think that the devil is after men like never before. This isn't part of my notes or anything. I just feel it on my heart. Everybody look around. Just look around. There's probably, what, 80% girls in here? And I'm not saying that like a, <laughs> it's a good thing. For all our single guys. But it's also a very scary thing. You guys want to know why the devil is after men? I can give you guys an easy example. I mean, if I understood Russian better, I would totally back you up, brother. I promise you. <laughs> Here's what it is. Well, one of the reasons. Men is the, a man is the head of the household. A man eventually becomes a father. A father has a son. The relationship with the son and the father starts to reflect the relationship with the son and the father. See, if the devil can distort our relationship with our earthly father, we'll be okay with the, like a semi-good relationship with our heavenly father. Whenever the heavenly father relationship starts to really come in down upon us, we start thinking, man, maybe our earthly father relationship is supposed to be different. So I just want to challenge us, like, man, it just sucks that there's not enough guys here. This just hurts a little bit. Because devil is so, so after them. Man, I'm so excited, guys, tonight. I know that the Holy Spirit is in this place. And actually, contrary to what 99% of the preachers will tell you, I want you to put your notebooks away. Um, the reason being is if you want to take notes, listen to, the, uh, listen to it afterwards. But I think that there's something going to happen tonight here. And actually, I know there is. Are you guys excited? Are you guys excited? Thank you, Joe. Backing me up. Okay. Yeah, okay, I want to encourage you guys too. If you guys are starting, okay, first off, I want to tell you this. We're doing a Holy Spirit uh, series. And Rod talk, if you guys were at AM service, Rod talked about the Holy Spirit being a tutor. Larry talked about the Holy Spirit today, um, about just being such an intimate father for him. And we're going to continue that series. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Because I honestly believe that a Christian's life without the Holy Spirit is non-existent. You can't be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. And just like Dan was reading, Jesus says, it's better that I go than I send him. So, like, how can that be possible that God, King on earth, wants, says it's better for him to go, that the Holy Spirit comes? I'm, I'm just going to read a couple of passages. Don't flip there. And remember, like, I want you to open up your hearts rather than your notebooks, okay? Because sometimes we can get distracted. And I think that there's going to be key moments. Like, honestly, from the bottom of my heart, I know this word is so, for so many of you. And this word has been on my heart for a couple of weeks now. And it's for this day and age. Like, I'm so confident right now because I know that the Holy Spirit is behind me. And I'm, like, so excited for what God's going to speak right now. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, it says this. This is what we speak. Not words taught by human wisdom, but words taught by the Spirit. Explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept these things because it comes from the Spirit, but considers them foolishness. The, oh, one second, let me read uh, verse 14. It says, the person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are only discerned through the Holy Spirit. Words that are spoken that are not filled with the Holy Spirit become religion in your life. Words that are spoken that are sets of rules that you try to follow becomes religion in your life whenever they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. We can read the word and we can even not understand. Sometimes, you, I, I, am I the only one that like, reads the word? Sometimes I can go a whole chapter. Man, I talk fast. I'm going to slow down. I can go a whole chapter and I can be like, man, what did I just read? You guys know what I'm talking about? You wake up in the morning. You try to get your good, your alarm set. You're going for it. You read a chapter and you leave and you're like, man, the only thing I was thinking about was like breakfast. I can't, I don't even know what... What I was just reading. But what Paul is writing in here is he's saying, listen, what we're going to talk about whenever the Holy Spirit speaks to a person that doesn't have the discernment of the Holy Spirit, it sounds like foolishness. It's going to sound like foolishness. I can preach the best message possible. But if your heart's not open to the Holy Spirit, it's just going to sound like religion. And you're going to be able to find all the faults in my message and miss what God has for you. So let's just bow our heads right now. God, I thank you that you're in this place. 
Holy Spirit, we invite you, God, into our hearts right now, God. I just pray for every single person here, God, that is just struggling, God, that needs a word, God, that needs a word that to get them through their week, God, to get them further, Father. And I just pray that tonight you empower them, God. You equip them, Holy Spirit. And, God, we are encountering you, God. We're ready for you. We want to be led by you, God. I'm so thankful, Father, that you're in this place, God. And, Holy Spirit, I know that I know that I know that you're in here, God. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that the words that are spoken, when they're filled with the Holy Spirit, lives are changed, things are different, God, and everything can shift. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You guys believe that? Come on. So, and again, I just want to kind of go over again what uh, Dan was saying. And John, Jesus said, but in fact, it's best that I go because if I don't go, the advocate, also known as the comforter or the helper, won't come. If I don't go. But if I do go, he will come. Our main passage tonight is going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Again, you're not taking notes, so I'm just saying that. This is the Bible that I'm reading from. Um, so in 1 first, in first Corinthians chapter 2, this is what Paul writes. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things that God has revealed to us by his spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even deep things of God, for who knows a person's thought except their own spirit within them. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the, what we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit is from God, so that we may understand what God has given to us freely. I'm going to read verse 12 one more time. This is going to be like my verse that I'm going to go off of tonight. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has given to us. So, again, this could be one of those passages we can read and be like, man, what was that? That was a lot of stuff that he said. So no ear has heard, no eye has seen, no one has thought of the things that God has for those who love him. Make sense? No one can fathom what God has prepared for his children. No one can speak to you and say, hey, this is the cap. This is what God has for those who love him. Those things are revealed by the Holy Spirit who searches all things, including those things that God has prepared for those who love him. We receive the Spirit who is from God so that we can understand the things that God has freely given to us. So the whole idea that I want to Get across tonight. And the title of the sermon, they asked me for a title, is Freely Given, right, Vika? That's what I said, yeah, Freely Given. <laughs> I texted it to her, I just don't remember. Like, I'm not good at titles. Freely Given. So, again, this is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And Paul was writing all of these things, that the Holy Spirit is supposed to discern the things of God. And I promise you, we're going to jump back to that verse and back to that chapter in a little bit here. Um, and do you guys remember the days before iPhones when you all had iPod touches? Do you guys remember that, or am I the only one? Like that silver one that the back of it, it had like the black thing and they didn't have a camera on it, and you had that and you're like, man, this is so awesome. So I remember when I would have my iPad, iPod, I'm just gonna use my phone, but pretend this is an iPod touch, one of those first gens. And what would happen is, if we had the Wi-Fi router over here, you get further away from the Wi-Fi router, you're not going to have no service. When you're over here, when you're close to it, you're good. Okay, this is going to be my Wi-Fi router, just so that I'm a visual person. When you're close to it, you're good. You get service, you get downloads, you can be good. But as soon as you start leaving it a little bit, you start walking away further, your signal becomes less and less strong. And in fact, it can get so bad that you're not going to be able to send your message, your Snapchat won't go through, we didn't have Snapchat back then. But anyways, the whole point is that the further you get away from it, the worse it's going to become. You have no service. So many of our Christian lives have now become like an iPod touch and a, a Wi-Fi router. What I mean by that is we have to go to church in order to experience God. Whenever we're in the church setting, whenever the lights are dimmed down, whenever the word is good, whenever the, the, the worship team is play, playing the right song, whenever the chords are on point, whenever the drummer is going off, we have such a good connection with God and we're feeling like, yes, this is it. This is the glory of God. Unfortunately, as soon as we start going past these doors, as soon as we start leaving, when we actually need the Holy Spirit, we start losing connection. 
It's interesting to me that our spiritual Christianity has become so dependent upon church that if we take the church away, your spiritual walk is non-existent. See, there's a problem whenever Christians depend on the worship. Depend, there's nothing wrong with the worship. Don't get me wrong. But it's, ooh, we're going to get good right now. I'm going to keep going. I don't want to jump the gun. We cannot be dependent upon the, ro- the Wi-Fi router. What God has given us, hallelujah, an iPhone with a SIM card. You can walk straight through those doors outside and keep on going and you'll still be connected. You can still be connected. You can still get what God has freely given to those who love him. And we're going to continue in that and we're going to keep on jumping back to that. Whew. That's the pre-sermon. pre-sermon. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, it talks about the armor of God. I need to stop talking so fast. I know I talk fast too. And like whenever I know I talk fast, I start talking faster. It's just, it doesn't help. Okay, it says, put on the full armor of God. Put on the shoes, the belt, the breastplate, and so on. Then it says, put on salvation as your helmet. Take up your sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We're going to make connections here in a little bit. So stay in with me. That's why I didn't want you guys to take notes. I want your attention span. I know it's hard. So what we're going to talk about is uh, Israel. In Judges chapter 19, there's the story that's in your Bibles that when I read it, I was like, I didn't know that this kind of stories were in the Bible. This is pretty gruesome, okay. So bear with me. Um, so a man, it has, he has his concubine and his concubine runs away from him. And what he does is he leaves his home, and this is in Israel, so the, the chosen people of God. He leaves his home and he goes into her city um, and he goes to her family. She ran back to her family and she was there for two months. He comes back after her and he's like, hey, like, yo, you're coming back with me. What's going on, girl? And as he's about to leave, the father's like, hey, you're already here, man. Come on, hang out, chill. Like, have some drink, have some bread. Well, it's a long journey, and it's already evening. He's like, okay, fine, I'll stay the night. First night passes. Second day, he's already getting ready to go and leave. And the father's like, hey, come on, man, let's just drink and eat. And he's like, okay, fine, let's drink and eat. And then the second night happens, the third night happens, the fourth night. And on the fifth night, so he's already there for three nights, or four nights, sorry. And on the fifth, fifth morning, he gets up, he's like, let's sit, I'm going. He's like, let's eat and drink. He's like, okay, let's eat and drink. And then when evening came, he's like, hey, it's already late. Come on, let, just stay. He's like, no. We're leaving. That's it. I'm tired of this. I, I need to go. So he overstayed his welcome. He was somewhere where he wasn't supposed to be for too long. And he got his girl and he started leaving with his servant. So they start walking back towards their city. This is in your Bibles, I promise. This, is a, this story, when I read it, I'm like, Lord, this is, this is graphic. So he starts walking to a city and they pass the city, which is an Israelite city. Um, and he's like, hey, let's just go there for the night. The next city is too far away. He's like, no, 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 no. We're going to continue. Oh, I apologize. They're passing the city, and he's like, let's stay in the city, and this city is not of Israel. So it's not of Israel, and like, no, we need to go. We're going to only go to the city of Israel. So they keep on going. They pass this city. They keep on going over here, and as they get there, they get into the square, and it's already dark at night, and this man sees them. He's like, dude, what are you guys doing in the city? Like, you can't be here in the square at night. So he grabs those people, and he's like, uh, the three people, so the servant, the man, and then his concubine, and he takes them in. And the city sees this. And all of the city, it says, they all came up to this man's house and they started hitting at the doors. They said, bring us out this man so that we can have sex with him. And they start smashing his doors, hitting his doors. And the man that took him in, he's like, hey, don't do this to my guests. Like, you guys can't dishonor me like this. Don't do this to me. He's like, take my daughter and his concubine and do whatever you wish with them. And this is in your Bibles. What happened then is he let them outside the doors and all night they they raped them and they abused them. All night. In the morning, when morning came, the man came out and his wife was dead. She was dead and uh, it doesn't say anything about the man's daughter, but she was dead. And so he took her body and he walked back to his village. And instead of burying it, like you would think what normal people would do, he took her and he sent a message to all of Israel. He cut her body up into 12 pieces and sent her to all 12 tribes of Israel. In, verse, in Judges chapter 19, verse 30, it says this. Everyone who saw it said, such a horrible crime has not been committed in the time since we left Egypt. Think about it. What are we going to do? Who's going to speak up? 
And so all of Israel gathers together. All of Israel gathers together to hear the story. Like what in the world happened in this village? This stuff doesn't happen. Nobody, this, this should not happen. This should not happen in a city that is Israel. Especially because they passed the city that was not of Israel. And so the man tells the story to all the people and he asks them this question. What are you guys going to do? And so Israel got together and they said, we will not go home to our wives. We're going to go and wipe out this city. So 12 tribes of Israel are about to go get together. But the tribe of Benjamin says, no, we're going to back up that city. That is sinful. So 400,000 men with their swords equipped are ready for battle. The Benjaminites have 26,000 men. 27, sorry. 27,000 men that they're defending that wicked city. And they say, um, the Israelites say to them, like, why are you guys defending this city? Like, this is not a right. What they were doing is not right. And the Benjamites say, hey, we're not backing down. And so this is what's amazing to me. This is, you're like, where is he going with this? He's just going on in these crazy stories. So 26,000 Benjaminites and 700 men from that city, it's called Gibeah, um, they came to battle. And in Judges chapter 20, verse 19, it says, the next morning, the Israelites got up and pitched camp near Gibeah. The Israelites went out to fight the Benjaminites and took up battle positions against Gibeah. The Benjaminites came out of Gibeah and cut down 22,000 Israelites in the battlefield that day. But the Israelites encouraged one another again and took up their positions where they had stationed themselves the first day. The Israelites went up and wept before the Lord until evening and inquired of the Lord. They said, shall we go up and fight against the Benjaminites, our fellow Israelites? The Lord said, go up against them. I don't know about you, but whenever I'm reading this passage, whenever I'm understanding this story, you would think that the righteous prevail. You hear all of the stories that God stands behind Israel and he makes everything happen. But here Israel is fighting Israel. Like within Israel there's a battle going on. And 400,000 men lose 22,000. Again, it's like, what is the, I don't know the math on that. But there's like at least 10 times that much, if not more. And they're dying. And they go up to the Lord and they say, God, we lost so many men. What do we do? And they continue and the Lord says, go and fight again. You know what happens the second time? Then the Israelites drew near Benjamin the second day. This time when the Benjaminites came out of Gibeah to oppose them, they cut down another 18,000 Israelites. This is the second time they're going to battle against wickedness and they're defeated again. What amazes me about this story is that Israelites, they did not just save their losses and say, hey guys, you know what, whatever, let's just go back and just go back to our families. We already lost 30 plus thousand men. And we should just go back and save what we have. Because this is getting kind of ridiculous. Those guys, there's like none of them. And they're just chopping us down. What they said is they kept on going. And they kept on declaring war. Most of us Christians, what our prayer life looks like is we're praying for repentance. And asking God to help us get out of the things of our wickedness. Out of the things that we've been struggling with. Out of our addictions. Which is a good thing. But that's as much as you can go. You don't even try to fight for anything more. You just try to preserve what you have. You don't try to fight and expand the boundaries of where God is going to move in your life. But you're just trying to be content with where you're at. Yes, you'll get into heaven. But are you going to have anything to give to God? Israelites, although they've had so many losses, they go up to God a second time. Lord, what do we do? God, we've lost so many men. We should have just wiped them out immediately, but there's so many of them. And they were staying for a good cause. Guys, you can be fighting a good cause. That doesn't mean the victory is just going to come easily. Where's the backbone of our Christianity come from? Does it come from a worship setting, a sermon that's supposed to be spoken to you? And so they came up and they drew a third time. A third time they went up against them. And it's kind of a longer battle this time. But in short, the third time they asked the Lord, do we go up? And the Lord said, go up. And he said, I will stand behind you. And I will deliver them into your hands. And the second time, sorry, the third time they went up, they attacked and 25,100 Benjaminites died. They basically ambushed the city. 
they killed all the Benjaminites. Then it says actually that they killed every single living thing in that city. So complete wickedness was wiped out. So many Benjaminites died that they had to get wives for the Benjaminites. They almost wiped out a tribe of Israel. But the point is, they kept on fighting when even though they had defeat. Us Christians, we almost like to fight only the battles we know we're going to win. We like to fight the battles that are going to be uh, victorious in our life. Because there's certain compromises we're making in our life that we've lost so many times that we've kind of been okay with it. That we've made an exception for it. And we stopped making battles against it. Even though it's within our life. And we're the body of Christ. We're Israel. And there's a war that goes on. Oh, I'm excited. I'm excited right now. God is so good. And God is saying, go to war. After defeat, after defeat, he says, go to war. You know what I've noticed in my Christian walk? Is there's no shortcuts to it. As much as I would want to say, hey, the battle you're facing today, here's what you do. Exactly, and it's going to stop. There's no shortcuts to it. The only way... The only way to get through with where you're going is to have a prayer life with God. It's to have a prayer life with God. The ultimate point is for you to spend time with God and not try to replicate what other people are doing and chasing what other people are doing. But the most important thing is to spend time with him. It's so important to spend time with him. And... So many of us, what we do is this. We go spend time with God and we don't hear anything from him. You guys ever been there? You go into your prayer closet and you're like, man, I don't hear nothing. And the reason for that, I believe one of the good reasons for that. There's a lot of people in here. I guarantee you if I took one person that you didn't know and I set you guys up one-on-one -on -one just to go hang out, it would be pretty awkward and you wouldn't have much to, much to talk about. Whenever you don't know somebody, you don't have a lot of them to talk about. Whenever you just spend time with them here in a crowd, there's so many of us here, and this is the only time you spend with them, you don't know them very well. And so whenever you do go spend time with them alone, you don't hear anything. Here we go. You guys ready? This is it. Jumping back to uh, 1 Corinthians, it says, what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given to us. And then earlier we talked about how the spirit is the sword. I want to bring to you guys' attention. God sent the Holy Spirit so that the word will become alive. You can know of the word, but it can have no effect in you if it's not used. Let me tell you a secret. The devil does not care and cannot do anything about the gifts that God has given you. He doesn't care. It doesn't matter for him. He's not after trying to, like, take the gifts he can't. If God has freely given to you something, he can't do anything about it. But what he will do is he will make sure that he does his absolute best so that you will not understand the things that God has freely given to you. What he'll do is he'll make you say, hey, you have to go two weeks to be pure for God to start using you. Hey, you have to spend six hours in your Bible study for God to start speaking to you. Hey, you have to be this good. And he starts building up these religious laws in your life that you have to start thinking, man, God, what do you really have for me? The devil will do anything he can to make sure that you don't understand the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And what the Holy Spirit will do is he'll start speaking those things to you in your prayer closet. What happens in modern day Christianity is that so many of us, so many of us relying on this. So many of us are relying for someone to come up and start speaking life into you. So many of us are relying on someone who's filled with the Holy Spirit to start giving you a revelation. No, 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 my friend, they will fail you. It's not this, is, this, this thing's job for them to you, for you to receive the revelation of Christ. It's the Holy Spirit's job, and it will never be filled. No podcast, no YouTube sermon, no series, nothing will be able to get you through where you need to go. Only the Holy Spirit is the one who has enabled us. And unfortunately for us, yeah, we can give it up for him. I feel like I'm chopping you guys up a little bit, but that's because I got chopped up a little bit. Unfortunately for us, what we do is we go to church. 
Can I get somebody on the keys? I'm a visual person. This is what the majority of our Christian lives look like. Worship goes up. It's a good word. We have a good message at the end. We have an altar call. We encounter the Lord. Chains can be broken. It's pretty good. That's a good word. Okay. One week passes. Oh my gosh. It's so bad. Man, it's such a hard week. Man, I got to fight, man. I can't. I can't get over pornography. Man, I can't get over the anxiety. Man, I really hope they speak a good word. Man, I really hope they speak a good message because I really need a breakthrough right now. I really need a breakthrough right now. Jesus comes, chops the chains off. Another seven days pass. Lord, please God, please God, please God, please God. And you're trying to look for a shortcut. You're trying to say, God, I want you here at church. I want you, but I don't really want to take you where I need you. It's interesting to me that Christians will take this and be so good around this sanctuary, but they leave their swords where they need them most. You know what I believe a Christian life looks like? Let me show you. This is what a Christian life could look like. I want to challenge you if your life doesn't look like this. It's a good word. It's a good message. Somebody can be shouting. You can be screaming. It's okay. You respond to the altar call. Just sharpening your blade. You don't even need the sheath. You leave it. Seven days pass. Here's the head of Goliath. I just slayed him. Who will go help me take his brothers down? This is anxiety. Who will help me take it down? Here's fear sword. Fear used to dominate me. Now I wield it. This is pornography that I haven't been able to overcome in such a long time. Now I can help my brothers set free those guys that are lusting. This is those people that are insecure. Man, God, you are my security. We're going to break some chains. See, what a Christian life is supposed to do is it's supposed to empower you to go out there. But so many of us are so dependent upon this stage for your Christian walk. Sometimes... A message could be good, and I can rally you up, but whenever you don't have a word, it's useless. I'm not talking about this sword. This sword is just representation. What I'm talking about is this sword, the very word of God, the very word of God. And if you don't have revelation of it, you're not going to understand it. It's going to sound like foolishness to you if you don't understand what this has. don't even know. The Holy Spirit's job is to reveal what God has for those who love Him. Whenever you wield this weapon, whenever you spend time with Him in your prayer closet, you start knowing how to wield this weapon. See, the Word of God comes alive when the Holy Spirit comes to fill you up. So many of us rely on a setting for it to be filled up in the Holy Spirit. But in all reality, there's no shortcut you have to spend time in prayer. You have to spend time on your own in your prayer closet when you're seeking God one-on-one. -on -one. You see, God is not limited to this stage. He's not limited to this place, to this platform, to these walls. We are. Guys, we created the church, the building of the church. It's God's church, don't get me wrong. But this is just a man-made thing of, hey, Find me in the Bible where it says, hey, you're going to have worship first, then an offering, then a preaching, then a testimony. Sometimes we'll switch it up. We're trying to be effective for you to understand 
that the Holy Spirit has empowered you. Come on, somebody shot me down. What God will do is he will make mighty men out of shepherds. What he will do is he will make kings out of shepherds. He says, put down the staff, pick up the sword of your enemy, and take down his head. The kingdom of Israel shall not be divided. Those men that fought for Israel, each of them went to battle with the sword. Each of them had something to equip with themselves. And it was the word of God and the Holy Spirit. Where are you going to battle? You want to know why you're still addicted to the same thing? You've been addicted for five years in your Christian walk? You don't know how to use one of these. You're dependent upon the preacher speaking such a good word that will get you from week to week to week to week. And you're like, oh, oh. You're living a Christian lifestyle that is repetitive and you don't get anywhere. You don't know what it's like to live in victory and if you do, it's so temporary. You don't know what it's like to live free and you're just so temporary because you don't know who the Holy Spirit is and you don't allow him to make what the word is into revelation. When the word becomes revelation, your situation starts to change. When the word becomes revelation, you start wanting to spend more time with him. When the word becomes revelation, but it has to become a revelation. See, until it becomes a revelation, it's going to stay religion. You're going to say, go to life group, and you're going to miss the point. You're going to say, go to church, and you can miss the point. We're going to say, get on the worship team. You can miss the point. We're going to say, preach, and you can miss the point until you get the revelation that the word of God has for you. And there's no shortcuts. Man, I know I, I love to take shortcuts. And sometimes we think that it's a good thing. But can I tell you, my friend, if you try to take shortcuts, you're going to face enemies when you barely know how to wield a sword. You're going to be placed on the front line when you can barely wield a sword. Whenever you try to take shortcuts, whenever you try to go week after week just going to church, and you're not taking shortcuts, spending time with him out there, what begins to happen is that you come and you become defeated again and again. It's because you're trying to take a shortcut. You're waiting for this word that's going to change your life. When it's reality, it's the Holy Spirit that changes your life. You can't rely on me to do anything. All I can do is try to give you revelation of what the Holy Spirit can do if you allow him. Can we stand? It's interesting to me. Let's just say the stage represents the church. Here's what we do. I know it's a corny example, but I'm a visual person. This is the church. This is me outside the church. Worship's pretty good. Let's lay some demons right now. This is good. It's a good word. It's a pretty good word. I like it. Good job, Alex. What is that? This is not where you fight your battles. I don't know how many of you are in here, but how many, it's a lot less likely that you're going to be tempted with something when you're in here surrounded by other believers. Guys, you need to put this thing away. You should never have a separation between where the word of God can be in your life and where you are. So many of us, and I was there myself, was so dependent upon our uh, service that I didn't know how to wield the word of God. And the Holy Spirit will make the word into a revelation in your life that can change you and transform you. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has given to us. Guys, there's no shortcuts. I mentioned at the beginning, there's not that many guys in here. Guys, you're going to become husbands, and husbands are going to become fathers. Where, what are you wielding? Where is your sword? Woman, you're going to become wives, and then at the most high, you're going to become a mother. What are you wielding? 
You think that your battles are just gonna be won by themselves? You think that the things that you face, those daddy issues that you had, you're not going to have with your offspring or whenever you go further? Guys, youth is just a couple of years. And if you don't get it, you can go to church 30 years and you can miss the whole point. I've seen people that have been in church their whole life. They can recite everything, but they're not filled with the spirit. And all it becomes is religion. And we Slavs know this more than anybody. I'm not trying to dog on any church or anything. All I'm saying is if the spirit is not involved in your life, then you're not living a life that's called a Christian lifestyle. And that might be a hard pill to swallow, but I pray that you guys can see what no one has seen. That you will be able to know the thoughts of God and know what he has prepared for those who love him. I'm going to be real with you guys. It was that conference for me. George was praying and he was talking about the storehouses. He was talking about Joseph. And how he said, you can preach without having a prayer life. You can play on the worship team without having a prayer life. And the Holy Spirit did something to me that I don't think I've ever felt any time in my life. He began to show me so many areas of my life where I'd make compromise, where the word of God would be the last priority for me. Where I wouldn't spend time with him. I would say I would. I would read the Bible, but I wouldn't get revelation because all I was doing was reading a chapter to say I read a chapter. And there was no revelation and no word of God that was deposited in me that took root and that I allowed God to actually move. And I didn't give him the time of my day. And ultimately it came down to discipline and it doesn't become a convenience for us. So we're not going to do it because we can do it. And besides, Sunday's around the corner. So I'm good. I don't have to get in right with God. And the Holy Spirit started showing me these things. And he immediately took me to the point in the uh, book of Acts where there was the the woman and the man that sold their property and they said, hey, here's all the money they gave to the apostles. In reality, they kept some of it back. It wasn't wrong for them to keep some of it back, but the fact was they said this is everything while they kept something back. Holy Spirit is like, Alex, you sing these songs, you say take it all, but I don't have everything. He says, you say these things, but I don't have everything. You think you can fool me? That man instantly dropped dead. His wife came in, said the same thing, she dropped dead. Conviction of the Holy Spirit is unlike anything you'll ever encounter. Conviction is what empowers you to come to the altar and say, God, forgive me. I need a change. And then there's an actual change that can occur in your life. What happened is the Holy Spirit said something to me that made no sense at all. He told me all these things. He said, listen, you think you can fool me? You think you can fool God? You come to church? Great. What about out there? Do you spend time with me? When's the last time you didn't rely on a preacher for me to speak to you? And he said, Alex, I know I love you. See, that broke me. Because if he knew I didn't want to spend time with him, why would he still love me? If he knew what I was singing when I would say, God, you're, you take it all or whatever we sing, and it wasn't true, how can you possibly say that you love me? I'm not worthy of your love. And those, that sentence, I know, I love you, that's what draws us. See, whenever I look into this room, there's a lot of swords available at the altar calls. There's a lot of swords here in the building. But how about out there? See, the point of these messages, as contradictory as it sounds, it's not to get you through your week. It's to equip you and empower you. It's to equip you and empower you. The the church of God is not a storage for weapons. It's a place of sharpening. It says iron sharpens iron. It's a place of sharpening where you can actually learn to wield this a little better. When you're saying, yeah, man, this thing took some damage. This thing has seen some blood. But so many of our swords are just here on display for church. And that's as far as we ever go. And then when we need them, we come back. And when we don't, we're gone. They're nowhere to be seen. Our weapon of warfare is non-existent. Young people, there's no shortcut. There's no shortcut. There's no shortcut 
to your relationship with God. There's no shortcut to your revelation. There's no shortcut for your breakthrough. There's no shortcut for your security. Jesus can set you free tonight, but to sustain that freedom, you have to have a revelation from the Word of God. You have to take the sword and you have to walk with it. It says the sword of the Spirit. Now it's not just the Spirit of the world. It's the Spirit that God has given you so that you may know the things that God has for those who He loves. It's so easy to go to church. Guys, it's a wake-up call. We can't play playing games. I mean, how old do you think you have to be to really know God? How old do you have to be to go a week and actually pursue Him? Why is it that we repent about the same things over and over again? Listen, there's a problem if what you've been praying about for the last two, three years of your Christian walk about you trying to overcome this thing, that's a problem. And I'll challenge you to check your prayer life. I'll challenge you to see God do I really spend time with you? Worship team, you can come up. Guys, I don't want this just to be a sermon. That's why I don't want you guys to take your notes. Because you're not going to read them anyways. What I want you to do is open up your heart. See, God has given you something freely. You didn't do anything to deserve it. It's been freely given to you. Now the only thing you have to know is get the Holy Spirit to bring revelation of what those gifts were that were freely given to you. And as I mentioned, the devil can't do anything to take those gifts, but he's going to try his best to make sure you don't understand. If he can keep you from his presence at all times, he'll win. Where are your swords? An Instagram quote was cute and all, but when the push comes to shove, it's not going to do. You can post all the awesome Christian posts you want. You can repost things that sound really good. You can listen to Todd White, T.D. Jakes. You can listen to the best preachers, and you can be listening to their revelation. But the Holy Spirit has something for you. You cannot become dependent upon someone else. For if you do, when that person falls, your dependency will crumble. But whenever you're dependent upon the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, there's no demon that can attack you from hell. In fact, this place will come a place where demons and all these issues are just filled with the altar because we've slayed them all. And we're saying, God, we want more. We're going to continue to live righteously. We're going to continue to live boldly. And then we have Christians here arguing, is it okay to drink alcohol or tell two's okay? What kind of joke is that? When you're focused on the Word of God, you're not even thinking about those things. When you're filled with the Word of God, you start to move and you start saying, God, if I'm going to be more effective, not drinking, I'm not going to drink. If tattoos are an issue for somebody, why would it be an issue for me? I want to be as effective as I can. And so many of us are not effective because we don't know how to wield the sword. What are you going to battle with? What are you going to battle with? Wake up. Look what Christianity doesn't work. How many years got to go by for you to realize that you got to sacrifice something for God to start moving in you? You want to live in victory? Go pray. You want to live in victory? Make time for God. You want to get a revelation? Go listen to Him. Don't just come here. This place is a place of sharpening again and again. Man, the Holy Spirit is in this place tonight. It almost sounds contradictory to make an altar call after this kind of message because I'm telling you not to be dependent upon messages. But I want the Holy Spirit to equip some of you. Because sometimes it takes days like this to make you realize that there's more. It takes evenings like this for you to actually lay stuff down. You know whenever you actually lay something down and then when you just say it. Whenever you actually lay something down in your heart of hearts, you're like, oh man, it's kind of hard, but God, I'm going to do it. You know what's funny to me? This is absolutely a joke to me. The biggest battle us Christians, lukewarms especially, we have is coming up to the altar call. That's our biggest battle. What are people going to think about me while you're living in sin and hypocrisy out there? Man, the devil has some people so fooled so well. And he's keeping them from knowing what God has for those people whom he loves. I don't want you to become dependent upon them, upon me, but upon him. Guys, he can equip you so that when you come in here, you're holding up the head of Goliath.
you're saying, God has restored my family. God has helped me overcome perversion. God has helped me overcome fear. And you throw it. Who will go get, help me get his brothers? Who will help me fight for those that can't fight for themselves? We pray these prayers of repentance over and over and over again. And just like what if Israel should have done is maybe prevent their losses instead of going to battle again and losing more men. And we just preserve ourselves and we're saying, God, forgive me. We come to the altar calls and we say, God, forgive me. Please, Lord, this is the last time I promise God I'm separating myself for you. This is it. But God is saying, okay, take your sword. Take it. And we leave it. He's saying, okay, the same encounter you can have at home. The same Holy Spirit, the power of God can be with you when you need it. It's always available. God, I just thank you so much that you're in this place right now. Holy Spirit, I just pray for the shepherds that are kings in this place, God. For the people that are living a hypocrisy lifestyle, God. A lukewarm life, God, where you have no place for yourself, God. In their busy schedule, where excuses just come pouring out so much, God. Where they can make a thousand excuses instead of spending some time with you. Where they can make a thousand reasons why they shouldn't be with you. And the devil has them fooled. God, I pray you pull on their hearts right now, God. Holy Spirit, I know that I know that I know that you're in this place and you're not satisfied with church going Christianity, God. You want us to be slayers of giants. You want us to be slayers of giants, God. And I just pray, God, that your conviction come upon this place because your conviction will lead to repentance, which will lead to the word of God coming into our hearts. If this message is for you, make your way up front, but don't expect from me, expect from him. Expect from him, and he's gonna equip you. He's gonna begin to equip you. Maybe those swords that you've broken down, maybe those things that you've given up on hope, he's gonna equip you to overcome. He's gonna give you the desire to pursue him. He's gonna give you something that you've said you wanted for so long, but yet you're still struggling with the same issue again and again and again and again and again, and again, and again, and you can go your whole life and miss the point. The Holy Spirit is in this place right now. God, I just pray right now, God, that you just move in this place, God, that you equip people, that you give them a hunger, God, you give them a grace, God, to give them a conviction, God, those people, God, that say they wanna serve you, but they really don't give you the best time, God. God, I thank you that you're willing to wait, God. God, that you draw us, God. That you draw us, God. That you draw us near so that we may know who we are in you, God. That we don't have to live in repetitive sin. That we don't have to live a repetitive lifestyle where we go from week to week, God, almost binge eating your word, but we can have access to your word. God, we can live in victory, God. Holy Spirit, help us become more aware of your presence. Help us become more aware of who you are in our lives. God, I just pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, right now, for every single person, God, that doesn't know how to wield the word of God. Lord, I just pray that your conviction come upon this place so that it's not a place of religion, but it's a place of revelation that you're calling us near, God, that you're drawing us near, Lord. The Holy Spirit is in this place right now. Come on, start praying, start praying, start praying. Even if, even if you feel like you're well, word from God is good, he's gonna fill you up right now. He's gonna equip you to go further. He's gonna sharpen your sword. He's gonna equip you with the armor of God. He's in this place right now. You don't have to wait for the worship team. Don't wait for anything. If you feel it on your heart, start praying. He's here. God, your spirit is in this place right now, God. I just pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, for a true repentance to come upon our hearts, God. That we not live a life where we can fool ourselves, Lord. God, we need you, God. We don't want to live a repetitive, sinful lifestyle. We want to live a life separated for you. God, I thank you, God. God, that your spirit is in this place and you poured out just like you said you would. 
God, I just pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that the words we speak are filled with the Holy Spirit and they bring forth revelation in God. God, I just pray that in our quiet place, God, is where we get to know you more and more, God. That in our quiet place, we hear your word and we can move forward, God. God, I just pray that you pour out, God, and that we understand there's no shortcuts when it comes to our walk with you, God. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I just pray for your blood just to come upon this place, God. We really want to know you more, God. We want to walk in victory. We want to walk with the Holy Spirit. We want to know who we are, Lord. We want to know who we are in you. 